No one does breakfast quite like Subway. So wake up with the Sunrise Subway Melt on Toasty Flatbread. Made fresh in front of you, just the way you like, with whatever toppings you choose. Subway, build your better breakfast. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Welcome to the BS Report on the Subway Fresh Tech Hotline right now. One of our favorite basketball players in the BS Report. I think this is like his third or fourth appearance. I watched him last night at the Staples Center. Lost to the Clippers, but he's here right now. Steve Nash, what's happening? How much? What's going on? So you had... A chance yesterday to have zero points and 20 assists. When was the last time you went scoreless in an uh, NBA game? You know, I can't remember, but I think I think I probably had a scoreless night at least once or twice in the last three or four years. But it doesn't happen all the time when you play a lot of minutes. Are you aware as it's happening? Like, hey, wait a second, I haven't scored yet. Or is it you're just so caught in the game you don't even know like what your numbers are? I was aware, but not like in a, like, it's that I cared, you know what I mean? I knew I had, but I, I wasn't. Because you know, one, I think the way our offense is this season a lot of times, you know, we're, basically our offense comes down to pick and rolls, and, and then I read and react to the situation a lot of times with our team. You know, people are jumping out hard or, or trapping the pick and rolls. You know, so a lot of nights this year, it's just been the case where I just got to get the ball out of my hands quickly and let the other guys take the advantage of a three-on-two or, a, or move the ball and get something open so it's happened or you know especially lately a lot it seems like everybody's played us that way and you know i've had a lot of games where i've taken like last night i think i took four or five shots you know yeah. recently i had two shots in cleveland the other day in a, in a blowout win but it's just kind of the way it goes well, so you're it's because you're it's kind of an atypical nba team because normally nba teams have guys that you know, you could throw the ball to four or five guys and they could kind of create their own shot. But the way the Suns are constructed this season, everything revolves around you creating shots. So I guess like what the defenses are doing is just making sure that you don't shoot. And then because you're smart, you're just creating these shots for everybody else, right? Yeah, I mean, just try to, to, to take advantage of however they choose to play it. And I think one of the reasons we've been a little bit better the last month is that guys are, you know, kind of feeling more comfortable, you know, you know, when they get the ball, taking that advantage. So a lot of times, you know, the ball might come to a guy, and if he's not open for a, a jump shot, there's a guy running at him, which, you know, in our league is, is like a, you know, a great situation on offense. You know, yeah. You get by your guy, create something good. So you know, the guys have done a good job of that. And it's created a lot of offense for us. So, you know, we don't have that. We don't have that 20, 20 a game score. We don't have that kind of max contract guy you throw the ball to in the fourth quarter. And I think we have to find ways collectively to be good offensive and uh, to be honest that's why we struggled down the stretch of games like in the last five six minutes when the defense really tightens because we don't have that guy that you know draws a double team out of out of the post or you know gets to the foul line or, or does some of those things that you know i think good teams have down the stretch yeah, and you also don't have that irrational confidence guy who comes off the bench and scores like 17 points in five minutes which yeah. is another luxury that some teams have out there it seems like so it's like a tightrope for you guys. Like you have to execute for 48 minutes to hang in these games with these good teams. But you've been doing it. I mean, you're in the playoff hunt. Were you surprised? You know, thinking back like two months ago, it just seemed like you were headed for the lottery. There were trade rumors about you. Are you surprised that you're in the mix right now? I am. But going back to your earlier comment, we might have some irrational confidence guys. They're just not going for 17. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but it, it, it is. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I really give a lot of credit to Alvin and the coaching staff because, you know, we were like the organization said all year, we're a team in transition. We didn't make a move, really a big move in the summer. We didn't, or the, the winter, and we didn't really make a move at the deadline. And they stuck to kind of their stance of trying to be flexible for the summer. So, you know, but Alvin's taking a team that, you know, like we said, we don't have a go-to score. And he's found some combinations that work. And I think, you know, I think our starting lineup had, that five was like one of the top plus minus fives in the whole league. Yeah. Um, 
you know, the All-Star break, he's found a combination with the bench, that the bench has, has been better, and we've rebounded a little better. We're just, we're not a good rebounding team, and, and when the bench struggles, we really struggle, but those two areas got a little better, and here we are, you know, I think, like I said, in, in large part to Alvin and the coaching staff's work, you know, with a chance to get in the playoffs, so it's, it's, it's you know, it's a position, you know, I think we all are pretty fortunate to be in and, and excited for these last 15 games. Right, and you know, you you got caught into that whole trade rumor, trade rumor whirlwind, and uh, you know, what was interesting about it is you never wanted to be traded at any point, and yet, especially this is the way the internet works and the way it works when you cover basketball. You know, I know I did it. I you go into the trade machine, you make up fake trades with Steve Nash, and this is just something that was going on for five six weeks. Um, frustrating for you? Were you amused by it? How did you react to all that stuff? You know, to be honest, I'm, uh, and, I, and you know, probably people probably say this, but this is genuine. I'm oblivious to it. Uh, you know, I, I don't really, pay, I don't really, you know, follow basketball when I leave the gym. You know, if it game's yeah. on ESPN or TNT, I'll watch it, but I, I don't. And then you know, I'm not like online checking out all the latest. So when I come to the gym and the media asks me about it, that's kind of the extent of it. And, you know, I really believed the Suns when they said they didn't want to trade me. So I didn't really expect it to happen. They stuck to their word. But it's, you know, especially after 16 years, you you know, it's not as like if you're in your first two or three years in the league, you're probably nervous. And, you know, that uncertainty kills you. But when you played 16 years, like it, it really didn't creep into my mind at all. But you had, you've reached the point in your career that the only way they were going to trade you is if you went and asked to be traded, and you're not wired like that. You would never do that. So, it, I mean, it was kind of a non-story the whole time. Was there ever a point during the season, especially when you guys were in that slump, where you thought to yourself, eh, maybe they, maybe it's better for them if they rebuilt, and maybe it's better for me if I went to a good team? Well, I mean, for the last year, I've thought about it. A little bit, you know. Is it better for them? Is it better for me? Um, you know, I think to defend, you know, my situation—not defend, but to like kind of justify my situation. You know, regardless of whether it's better for them or for me, and all the different combinations. You know, my situation. I, I mean, of course, I'd love to be on a team right now that that has a chance to to be in the finals. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's not like that. Right? You can't just go to the front office and say, "Put me on a team that's played in the finals." Right. You know, it's like, you know, you open up a whole can of worms to say, yeah, okay, I want to get traded to a contender. Then they, you know, now it's, now it's gone beyond, you know, now everyone knows you've asked. And where do you go? Like, you just never know what, you know, because they're going to obviously want to do what's in their best interest as well. So it's tricky. And, I, you know, and I didn't feel like I want to take a step like that, you know, not only because of the unknown, but also because of what I would say or do to my teammates and the fans and you know we've had a lot of great times in Phoenix and I didn't want to just kind of overlook all that for for them to you know to put it in the mixer and see what comes out on the other side which could have been anything how much how much um the fact that other players in the league who are on your level have kind of put their fans and their teammates in that position have you noticed that did that affect the way you thought about this whole thing it, it didn't really. It was more a personal thing for me, but you know, I think also every situation is unique. So I, I've played ten years in Phoenix this year, and eight in a row, and uh, so it's, it's it's been a long time. It's been a lot of you know, a lot of games, a lot of success, a lot of a lot of good playoffs. And, you know, I just didn't really feel like you know, in my situation, comfortable just going in. Especially you know, I really like my teammates. We've got a lot of great guys. Uh, you know, it's just important to me, especially once we got ourselves back in the playoff picture it was it was like exciting to, to see if we could get in now so right how frustrated were you getting during the lockout because i know the way you're wired you probably spent the off season getting in shape you're ready to go it drags on it drags on season might get canceled you're turning i think you turned 38 this season it's not like you have uh 10 years left here yeah how panicked were you that that this might not work out well that was that was probably the, the biggest kind of source of irritation for me was, you know, I didn't, I didn't play basketball all summer. Um, you know, I usually come back, play in Phoenix in September with the guys and then go to training camp. You know, I, I work out all year round and stay in shape and, you know, try to get better, uh, you know, in different ways off the court. You know, I still shoot throughout the summer, but, you know, I didn't play it. And I was, you know, I did some therapy this summer to, to get to get over a couple things that, um, you know, also didn't, I didn't play. And then by the time I was ready to start playing again, it was, it was like, you know, when the college kids had all gone back to, to practice. So there was really nowhere for me to play. And, and when you're, you know, 38, 37 at the time, and, 
you know, you don't know if there's going to be a season. You haven't played basketball for six, seven months. You start to get a little, you know, I don't know about nervous, but you get a little anxious. Like, you want to get out there and play a little bit. So what would you do? I, I, I just kept shooting. I kept working. And I actually played, like, literally played two pickup games at the health club. <laughs> you played pickup games at a health club? Yeah, li- li- those were the only, basically, I played... You know, other than I went to Tony Parker and Boris Diaw, each had charity games in Paris that I went to. Other than that, those were, I played two pickup games uh, at, at, the, at my gym in Scottsdale. I met, you know, played like three times with my teammates before training camp. And that, that was it for seven, eight months. So you just get a little anxious, like, man, have I lost it? Or am I, yeah. how long is it going to take me to get it back and once we start practicing? And, well, plus because you guys, you hadn't really, you didn't make the playoffs last year, yeah. so you hadn't played since mid-April. Yeah, it was crazy. So, all right, well, wait, hold on. Let's go back to the health club thing. So, these guys are just playing basketball at some Scottsdale health club, and you know they're doing the whole. All right, I got next, and all of a sudden Steve Nash walks in. Like, what's the reaction when Steve Nash walks into the health club basketball game? Uh, I, I mean, I. I don't know. I think one. I was there like every day for four months, so oh. I don't think it was like you know I hadn't played, but they you know I was around, and then uh, they play like like Saturday mornings, like early. So I went up there, and uh, the first day, some a guy I think probably played D one was giving it to me. Really? <laughs> I hadn't played basketball literally in so long, and then, so I had to like you know go home, digest that, and come back with a vengeance the next Saturday to to. You know, to gain my pride back. Oh, that's fantastic! So you probably made that guy's life. That guy, he's, he's probably still talking about it and telling his friends that he killed Steve Nash at a health club, and they're like, "Yeah, yeah, whatever, buddy." <laughs> uh, he, he was good though, but uh, it, it was it was you know for me it was just like literally it's funny how how far you go. You know, you know, two years ago we're we're a couple games from the finals and we don't make the playoffs, and then here I am in like November, like. Just, just want to get on the court, right? <laughs> you know what I mean. So, like that little, those two pickup games for like forty minutes were like huge for me. You, you hated the schedule even before they had this lockout schedule. You were always, you know, anytime I've talked to, you, I've always talked about eighty-two games. It's a little too many. Why don't they do more about these four games of five nights stuff? You hate the schedule loss and stuff like that. Now you have this season, 66 games. Um, they added basically a little more than two games per month. Um, two weeks ago, you came in to play the Clippers, and it was the middle of a back-to-back-to-back, which they wisely sat you and Grand Hill for. But how much do you hate the schedule? I mean, it's it's ridiculous. But um, I, you know, I don't even know if there's another way to do it because there's a lot of you know a lot of people with hands out, uh, including the players. So we're yeah. almost trying to make as much as we can, and can't really do that without playing. So I get it. I, I don't know that there's an alternative that everyone could have got a percentage of of their of their checks. You know? Right. And so I mean, everyone get their worth. Sponsors. You know, teams, players, everyone's so TV. So, I mean, this is just, just the way it is. And, and you're right, I mean, even on a normal season, our schedule's, you know, almost detrimental to sport. It's right. really too much. And but, you know, again, I, you know, that's just the way it's got to be with the, the model we have. So, while, while it's not, like, the most, uh, you know, sporting schedule, it, it is what it is, and you've got to adjust that. It's a factor. Like, you know, there are scheduling losses, even in a normal season, let alone this year. But, I feel pretty good. I might tweak my back a little bit two nights ago, but uh, I'll be fine by the next game. And, and overall, I felt pretty good. But it, you know, I hope I just hope that uh, we don't have guys dropping like flies here in the last twenty-five days in the playoffs, or, or you know, a graveyard of injuries. What is the toughest part about when they add these games? Because you know, as a fan, I don't totally understand it because you you either practice or play anyway, but. You know, if, let's say you play 36 minutes during a game. Like, is it really that much more debilitating than if you had had a two-hour practice? You know, I think one very few teams practice for two hours throughout the season. Okay. I think once you once you get past like November, you know, your practices become so short. You know, even in a normal season, because you know, coaches don't want to. You know, it's about results. You don't want to wear guys out in practice. Now there are the odd coach that that works guys over all the way through the season, but. You know, most coaches' philosophy, and I think rightly slow, so, is to save guys' legs. And you know, you go, you spend more time on film, and you spend more time doing other things than you do killing guys in practice. So, you know, that, that there's that, and then there is, you know, there's it's a, it's not just, you know, practice is the physical stress. 
game is like physical, mental, emotional. You know, you're putting everything into it, and I think yeah. that takes a toll night after night. So, you know, even if you play 10, 12 minutes a game, you know, I think that's it's a game is a game. You know, it's not a practice. You know, you get out there, you shoot, then you go to the locker room, you come back out, you do your layups, warm up, then you go out and play the game. It's like, you know, you end up being on the court for three plus out four hours. Yeah. Um, it, and then, like I said, the emotional toll. So it, it's way bigger than a practice. So the, and the adrenaline swings, I'm sure, of just going out and being in front of 18,000 people doing totally. your thing. Yeah, I mean, it all takes a toll, right? Yeah. I, are you amazed that, you know, yeah, I think you were in the 96 draft, right, with Kobe yeah. and um, who else was in that draft? Iverson. Ray Allen. Iverson. Yeah, Iverson's long gone. Uh, Ray Allen is still around, I guess. Can uh, be. Oh, yeah, can be still around. Yeah, Antoine it's, Walker, Paige. Uh, yeah, those guys are gone. I mean, Derek Fisher. Did you ever think this many guys from that draft would still be kicking around in 2012? No, I mean, you know, I didn't think I'd still be playing, you know, way back then especially. But even like five, six years ago, I didn't think I'd still be playing, want to still be playing, and, and be in a position where I want to keep playing. So it's it's amazing that uh, there are so many guys still doing it. What would you, if you had to rank the factors, I mean, I know dieting has been a huge thing for you, right? Diet, sleep. Sleep. No, yeah, you yeah. Know, you know how to sleep now. Explain that thing. <laughs> well, I, I don't necessarily know how to sleep. I'm still a shitty sleeper. But uh, <laughs> um, the uh, you know, there's just how important it is to prioritize. You know, it's like one. Of, you know, I think it's it, it makes sense, doesn't it? Like if you sleep, you're you're gonna you know you if you don't get a good night's sleep, are you like irritable? Right. You know, I mean, it's the same. Not only is your body not going to recover it's his best time to recover is when you're sleeping but also just your your mind and you know we already talked about that like emotional mental mm. you know commitment you, you give to the game when you don't sleep well you know that that's on top of you you know i always find like you know when i get on the refs yep. you know a lot of times i'm tired you're cranky yeah cranky just irritable you know they do something you know i'm just i want to go and bitch and moan at them and you know if, but if, if i got it you know if i'm if i'm rested and i feel good you know i don't care what they call you know well and also you guys have to be basically at the peak of your powers at an odd time of the day you know like it'd be it could be 10 o'clock at night and it's crunch time with some game yeah and at that point especially they you know you have kids like you might have your kid might have woken up at 5 45 that morning totally and uh it's just it's weird I, actually we did a podcast with bill Hader from Saturday Night Live yesterday that hasn't run yet, but he was talking about just how strange it is that they have to peak from an adrenaline standpoint at 11.30 at night, and that's yeah. one of the reasons they have that weird schedule where they all basically sleep late and get up late and all that because of how they have to peak. But yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that's, that's like the, uh, you've heard some of these teams like Portland, I think they did Boston, the, the sleep doctor. Right. Or the same situation, right? What a good gimmick, by the way, the sleep doctor. Yeah, right but... <laughs> Uh, where does it rank uh, on the highlights of your career that you've turned Jared Dudley into this lean, mean fighting machine who's actually like a legitimate two guard now? I never thought he would be a real two guard, but he kind of really is from a quickness standpoint now. Yeah, I mean, he, I mean, I guess when you look back to him in college, the cornrows and kind of overweight. Kinda kind of. Like, yeah, he kind of just like found a way to get it done, um, you know, to now he's. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's transformed himself, and uh, he is a legitimate two guard. You know, he's, I mean, he's always, he's always going to be, I think, uh, an NBA player because he's intelligent and has good skills. But, you know, he has, he's found a way to get himself a great champ. I think this will give him a chance to have more versatility and play longer. You know, another thing that happened this season, which worked against you, other than the schedule and uh, your age, all that stuff, all of a sudden, th these are the best. Uh, Best slew of point guards I think we've ever had, at least since you've been in the league. Um, Kyrie Irving, Ricky Rubio. It just seems like they just year after year they they add two more guys. Um, who has been the guy this year that surprised you the most that you went against? Of the rookies. Yeah, or just the younger guys, the under twenty five guys. Well, I mean, there's. I mean, like, I agree with you, or, or at least I feel like it's. You know, and I, I haven't seen every age of the NBA, but as a fan, you know, I feel like this has been the best crop maybe ever and, and that I've ever experienced for sure. I mean, just like top to from Jason Kidd and myself all the way down to Kyrie and, and Rubio. I don't know if I've ever seen so many good point guards um, and diversified, you know. I mean, right. Guys who are just like straight 
straight up point guards to like the Derrick Rose and Russell Westbrooks who are kind of like I, I don't even, they're kind of like super guards to me and they kind of like created a new position but yeah um, you know it's amazing and, but uh, you know Rubio is fantastic I think he's got such a great feel for the game and great energy and passion and you know teammates love him and then but Kyrie Irving is like very special you know, he can, he's such a natural with the ball he can get where he needs to go and you said uh, I remember a couple years ago you told me that Baron Davis was the toughest guy for you to defend just because of how big and physical he was who is who has the title right now of the guy that you just say oh that guy's on the schedule tonight yeah I mean I think for point guards you know you look at Derrick Rose and, and, and Russell and you think like just physically they kind of have that same thing work like that Baron did when he was you know Golden State healthy, there. He yeah. healthy and everything where he just is like a great great athlete but also like heavy strong but fast jumps quick you know skilled so you know when, when, when Russell or, or Derek you know put their head down and go to the basket and they shoulder you in the chest you know you know someone just hit you right you know, they're, they're phenomenal physically and, uh, and obviously you know we've seen their skill level just improve every single year what about last night you and Chris Paul, and hey, you guys have been playing against each other now, I think, for seven years, something like that. I got the feeling, watching the two of you, that each of you knew every one of the other guy's tricks at this point, and it was pretty interesting to watch. It was like watching two people play chess who already knew everybody, the other guy's, every move that was coming. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I got, I got a kick out of it. It was pretty enjoyable. Do you enjoy going, when you reach that point with somebody where you know all of their moves, basically? Yeah, I mean, he's, uh, yeah, I mean yeah, you think about it, we play against each other, well, I don't know how many times, but a lot. And, uh, you know, you do get a, a feel. And that's, I mean, he's, you know, when you talk about, like, a pure point guard, you know, he's got to be at the top of the list or, or right there. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's it's always a chess match, especially like I think for point guards nowadays, a, a big a big part of it is how the other team chooses to to play the pick and roll. Yeah. Um, you know, because so like on a night, you know, Chris or even myself could have thirty points, and then the next night, you know, you could have you know eight or ten or whatever, and uh, it's just how. But you know, a huge assist, and maybe you won the night you had eight or ten points, and you lost the night you had thirty. And, you know, it's just about how, what the other team wants to give up to your team, how they feel like it's best suited in a matchup for them. And so that's always, I think, a, a big part of the equation that maybe the, the casual fan doesn't understand when they just look at a matchup. Well, was it, what was it, the 2005 playoffs when uh, I think it was maybe against Dallas? It was one of those series where they were just playing you. They were Basically, they wanted you to score. That was the game plan. Yeah. And I think you had like 48 in one of those games. Yeah, I did. Um, not not like, not in your wheelhouse normally, but you took oh, what the defense gives you. I felt like George. It was awesome. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean they they just want to take away all my passing angles. So a lot of times they kind of they, you know the the only option was to shoot. So it was uh, you know kind of that was the way they decided to play it. It's a good example of you know you know how 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 what a swing it can be from one night to the next. Right. I want to ask you about Mike D'Antoni because, uh, or Mike D'Antoni. I always say D'Antoni like an idiot, but it's Mike D'Antoni. Sure, um, you know, y- you guys came so close for that four year stretch from 05 to 08, and you could make a case like with all of those teams, it was one break here, one break there. This game could have gone this way, and, and you ended up not winning. You, know, you didn't even make the finals. And then he goes to the Knicks. Didn't really ever feel like he had the right roster ever. He gets fired. They start winning, and now it's like, you know, you look back at at his career and and what he did. And do you feel like that style that he you know loved so much could ever have translated into a title? Like, do you feel like when you look back at those four years that he had the right idea and you guys just had some bad breaks? I, I think he definitely had the right idea for our group. Yeah. So, for first, second of all, I think. You know, it, it could have, we weren't far off. You know, we did have some bad breaks. You know, I, I hate to pin it on breaks, you know, but uh, we did have some bad breaks. I mean, obviously, um, every year something happened. But, um, you know, I, I think it would have worked. I think the biggest thing that we were missing um, was a defensive center. 
Yeah. You know, if, if, and it didn't have to be a guy that could, you know, to play 35. We just had a defensive center for, you know, 15, 20 minutes a game. I think it would have made a, a real difference for us. But uh, but having said that, you know, I think, you know, if you wanted to take out a couple of years, I, I think it's hard for me to say that it wouldn't work when, you know, the year against San Antonio that they won it, uh, you know, they had to be at the suspension. You know, so we go home with a chance to go up 3-2 and Boris and, and uh Amari, who happened to be our only power forwards on the roster, and on a roster that really didn't have center, yeah, you know, get suspended. We go home and have to play, you know, a very good Spurs team without, you know, our any of our limited size or our front court talent. So, you know, I mean, I think it very. Why not? Could it? Why could it not have worked that year? I mean, I think that that's fair to say. It definitely could have that year. Yeah, and oh five. I actually thought oh five was your best chance, just because the league was the weakest that year. Uh-huh. Joe Johnson breaks his face basically. He's out that year. And then you yeah. got you guys never you just were a player short. O six Amari gets hurt. It just, you know, wasn't gonna yeah. happen after a certain point without him. O seven right. you had the suspensions. Although you know, I still think that Spurs team was really good. I mean, it would have been tough to beat that team four times. I'm not saying you could have done it, but I think that Spurs team you, that was Duncan's last really, really great year. Yeah. Uh Manu and Parker pretty much in their primes at that point. That would have been tough. I think it would have gone seven. It would have been tough to actually cut their heads off, I think. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, would, it was not, a, it wasn't, a, you know, like you can't look back on that series and go, if the suspension didn't happen, we were done, we were through. Right. But, you know, we were also at an all-time high. I thought Dia was playing at an exceptional level. Yeah. Uh, Amari uh, was great. and we, we had a nice team around, you know, uh, the, the main guy. So, you know, and it was a team with a lot of belief and a lot of kind of, like, we, gotten our heads chopped off for a couple of years in a row. We were kind of poised to like chop someone else's head off. Like right. we went into San Antonio on one. I can't remember one of those first two games at their place. So we put ourselves in a position where we believe we can win at home or on the road. So it, I, I, I agree with you. It would have been tough, but I think it was, that was a year that you couldn't say that San Antonio's system didn't work. So you think that was the best of all the teams? Yeah, I mean, I think that was the best of all the teams. Um, because of a number of factors, we added a couple of pieces, and we also had been through a few wars. Yeah. Um, whereas the first year was just a lot of fun. It was a lot of talent. We were, we were incredibly fast paced. You know, we never really were like that much. You know, again, uh, we were really up and like up and down the floor that year. And it was we went from no one picking us to make the playoffs to you know winning 63 games. So, but we still didn't really have any any size that, that played a lot. Uh, so it was it was always kind of a tall order when Joe broke his face he was such an important player for us yeah the Spurs were the Spurs I mean they're our champs already and uh, terrific and I have a ton of respect for him so uh, I don't know I don't, I don't think we had as good a chance uh, as we did in 07 and in 08 was kind of the sneaky year where I still feel like if you win game one of that Spurs series which you, you guys gave away three different times if you win that game and you get out of that, you know, all of a sudden you, you won game one in San Antonio. Now you have home court. Yep. And the West was, was pretty weak that year. That was the year the Lakers made the finals without buying them, basically. Um, I think that team could have made a run, too. And it really came down to Duncan making this insane three that I don't think he'd ever make again. Um, and then that was it. And then it goes to 2010. And that was a, I liked that 2010 team, too. I felt like you were right there in that Lakers series. Yeah, I mean the 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 one the series that I guess I guess it was the year of Shaq. We it was just crazy. You know, we had that game won so many times. And, you know, first we missed a sign, maybe we don't switch out. Mike Finley hits a shot to send it to overtime. And then, um, I think I hit a shot in the first overtime to like I can't remember what happened, but you know it was just back and forth shots that you know until Tim hit the shot. You know? Yeah, and it was just like wow, unbelievable. And then. That was it. You know, we lost all momentum, uh, all belief. It was almost like we, we didn't really know who we were yet because we were kind of a new entity. Yeah, uh, the trade had happened. Yeah, and and then to lose that first game, yeah, it kind of cut us out. But you're right. I mean, if we had won that game, who knows what would happen? But then 2010 was kind of a magical year. Not picked to make the playoffs. And, you know, tied two-two with the Lakers. And run our test to make that uh, puts the Kobe air ball back in. You know, yeah, you forced a great air ball. Yeah, forced a great air 
air ball and he throws in kind of a tough finish too like the ball's coming towards the hoop and he came across the hoop and found it and put it like high off the glass and then right um, and then we went back home to try to tie the series and Kobe just like totally took over that game right are you amazed because again he was in your draft and man he's he's leading the league in minutes this year <laughs> and, it, and it just when it it seems like no injury can stop him at this point, and for whatever reason, he's decided that he loves piling it on whenever it's Phoenix. I don't know what his anger is toward Phoenix, but for some reason, he's adopted you guys as the team he wants to torch more than any other team. What happened with with Phoenix and Kobe? I don't know the backstory. I guess uh, it was fan, it was something to do with fans. Uh, over some of those playoff series uh, Phoenix fans but you know I mean I think it's safe to say that, that Kobe doesn't need much to, to find much for motivation so right um, you know and I think he's, he's just finding a way to get himself up and, and to uh, you know do what he does when you think about your career now spanned 96 to 2012 basically three generations you know, that 90s generation when the players got overpaid a little too fast. Some of them didn't totally pan out. Then the Duncan generation and Kobe and KG, those guys. And now you're in this new generation with LeBron, Rose, uh, all these guys, Durant. Um, what? Who was the best player that you played um, over those 16 years? The first guy you think of? Jordan, for sure. Back in, you know, I, I came in in 96. He was still like, kind of his of his powers. Yeah. Um, he was uh, far and away, you know, the best. I mean, he just, he, he not only was he obviously Jordan and the skill and, and the championships, but he also, everyone was scared of him. Right. You know, no, I don't think anyone's really scared of anybody in the league anymore. People were scared of him. And uh, I just remember that. People were really intimidated by him. And uh, you know, I think you add that to everything else, it kind of separates him. Who do you think was the best guy from your generation? Well, Tough I mean, question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Kobe and Tim just on winning. Um, I'm missing anyone. Uh, I mean, well, they had the most rings. Kobe had five. Tim has four. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess Shaq has four. Yeah, I mean, if Sha- I kind of put Shaq in that '90s group, but yeah, uh, you know, he'd be right up there too if he was in that one. Obviously, he's, I mean, you can make a case for him over everyone, but um, you know, then I like KG. You know, such longevity. I know he was, you know, it was a lot of tough years in Minnesota too, but to get the championship in Boston and to keep doing it, pretty amazing. Who who do you think was the most underrated? Uh, no, that's a good one. Give me some candidates. Um, I feel like Duncan was underrated. Yeah, I don't yeah. feel like people even think he was one of the best guys from that era now for some reason. Yeah, I mean, he's, uh, yeah, it's typical Timmy, right? Like, Everyone forgets about him except for his four championships. And <laughs> yeah, and, and the fact that he was dominant. Yeah, yeah, you know, just like he couldn't beat him. He just blocked everything, got every offensive rebound, scored in the post on the stretch, and he passed the ball, set great picks. He just did it all. Dirk, I think um, Dirk hit a point where he became underrated, but then the title um, kind of moved everything back into where it should have been. But you know, there was. It seemed for a little bit there that the, what happened in the 06 finals and then the following year when they got upset in round one, that was just going to be the first sentence of whatever his legacy was going to be. Yeah, I mean, I think he. I think a lot of it was unfair, too. I think that you could probably make some point in the case that he took some heat in Dallas some of those years, but you know, it shouldn't have all, I don't think, fallen on him for sure. And then, you know, but. In typical fashion, he just kept plugging away. He's a hard worker, kept working, kept working, stuck with the same team for a long time. And there he is, pops up and wins the championship in a year. Where at the start of the playoffs, I don't think anybody really thought they were serious anymore. Um, and so, was, I mean, he's rightfully put himself up there. Tell me what your emotions were as that whole thing. One of your best friends, former teammate, um, neither of you had won a title. Both of you had kind of thought maybe you know that that possibility had passed you by and then all of a sudden he turns it on and on top of that um does it to miami yeah yeah i mean it was it was exciting i mean i think for me you know i felt good for him because like you look at the start of his career until the championship and it's like you know he he was picked ahead of what was it like he was picked ahead of paul pierce and everyone gave a hard time for nelly for that and then 
know, he struggled early on, and then he became an all-star, and then, you know, went to the Western Conference Finals uh, when I was there once, and, you know, became like a perennial all-star, and then they, they had some playoff um, disappointments, and everyone blamed him, and then nobody stuck with the same team for, I think it was like 13 years, and won a championship, so if you look at the whole picture, it's pretty amazing. So I was pretty pumped for him, obviously, and, uh, you know, those chances don't come around all the time, and, you know, they weren't one of those teams, like I said, at the start of the playoffs, you got penciled in your Final Four even, so, you know, I was pretty pumped when you got the chance and, and seized it. Were you pumped, like, on the level of Tottenham winning the Premier League pumped, or were you, like, Tottenham making no, the top four no, in the Premier League pumped? I don't, I don't think that pumped. I don't think either of those pumped. <laughs> Those, those, are, those, are, those are way more important than Durkee. All right, this is, this is the most important part of the podcast right now. Explain to our non-soccer fans who are listening right now why Messi is the single po- most important athlete to be watching right now. He's, he's just a wizard, you know. He's just, uh, he's, man, he's, he's, uh, he's just playing a different game than everyone else, you know, like what he can do with the ball, with his athleticism, his quickness, his versatility, you know, he's, he's just, nobody's, everyone's playing a different game. It's like when Tiger was at the peak of his powers, you know, like, this, he's playing something else than golf. Yeah. The ball farther, he's like, better putter, it's like, that's, he's just, he's just so good. You know, he's a little guy, he's really, really quick, and he, he put, he, like, one of the analogies I have is that he, he touches the ground so quickly with his feet like he's touching it more than you so when you like are trying to change direction and you lift one leg up to turn direction he's probably put his foot down like two or three times to your one right so as you're lifting it up to change direction he's like touched the ball twice and changed and gone in a totally different direction all in the span of you just lifting your leg up to change direction so he, he just puts people in such a bind he's just unplayable in, in so many situations and as you're trying to recover to him he's already got the shot off before you can lift your leg up to block it he's caught the keeper off guard and he's just I mean, he's phenomenal and, and he's able to do I mean people say well he's doing it with great players around him who we'll make it easy for him but you know at the same time he's also kind of you know reined himself in to, to fit into that system you know he he doesn't just take the ball and go on a, as they say in England, a daisy, like he's right. you know, trying to dribble through everyone. He waits until it suits him and his team most of the time. And, you know, so I like him, too, because he's a, he's a real team player. And he's also, the other thing that amazes me about him for how little he is, he's got that Baron Davis thing about him where people kind of bounce off him. Yeah, no, yeah. he's low center of gravity. Yeah. He's, he's powerful, and he does. He, and you know what I like about it too is everyone's trying to break his leg. And yeah, everybody. He never reacts. You know, he kind of, you know, very minimal reaction. Gets up, keeps playing, keeps going at people. You never, you know, like sometimes guys in that position they just get so pissed eventually they just lash out or they yell and scream at the ref. He doesn't give the ref, you know, too much of our time. But he doesn't give the other team the satisfaction. My dad played semi-pro soccer in South Africa and he played against Bobby Moore, who was a big star for England. And, Defensive, a defensive player, and, and he said that you know you can kick the living crap out of Bobby Moore, and he never give you the satisfaction of changing his facial expression. Right, and it was just demoralizing. You know, you're just like, oh, man, I just nailed him, and he's not doesn't even flinch. And that's kind of the way Messi is, right? Guys are just trying to like, just butcher him, and you never once get the idea that you're going to put him off his game. The other thing is, I've never seen another, and I've only been really seriously watching soccer since maybe 06. I've never seen another player who is able, when he's going full speed with the ball, and there's the guy chasing him right behind, and so many times in soccer, that guy who's right behind will trip the guy or do or right. knock his feet out or whatever. And Messi will stay like about a foot and a half in front of that guy for 50 feet. Yeah. As he's dribbling, it's like the guy just can't catch him and can't. He, he's going so fast that he can't trip him either. With the ball. Yeah, it's amazing. I think he's amazing. I don't. I mean, what would be the basketball equivalent to what he's doing right now? I mean, I think in some ways the the equivalent would be like Allen Iverson at his at his very best, just because of the size. Right. But uh, you know, but then like he's just even having way more of an impact on the game. Like if Alan Iverson was averaging forty-two points and ten yeah. assists a game, or something. Or, or, or if what Alan, if what Alan did, sorry, equated to like, you know, winning sixty-five games a year. Right. You know, what I mean, like he's 
doing maybe the same thing, but doing it so efficiently and so, you know, kind of easily that it's like, you know, like he, his team wins every night, kind of like the way you do when you have Tim Duncan or Shaq in the front. Right. Well, it must you be know. weird for you because, you know, you're a big Tottenham fan, but it sounds like it sounds like you go out of your way to watch Messi too. So uh, actually, you're, you're a sports bigamist now. I mean, uh, yeah, actually, uh, the whole Barcelona team. I mean, the way they play, you know, it's, it's the best I've ever. Seen. It's the best you know, for five, six, seven years now. It's the best soccer I've seen in my lifetime. And like anyone who doesn't like soccer, watch, try to watch a Barcelona game. And, you know, nine times out of ten, I think you'll you'll find a huge appreciation, even if you hate the game. Do you feel like uh, the the battle with Madrid, like they they played kind of a boring game recently. Are, are those, can you almost play too many times in soccer? Yeah, a little bit. I think it get like it get stale, but um, you know, there's so much there's so much at stake in those. Not only because of the rivalry and everything, but because uh, you know the fans. I mean, the fans in those sports are so rabid that they demand you know to get on top of the other team. Um, so it always keeps it the motivation sky high because the fans are just like. Unrelenting. Yeah, this has um, been pretty interesting. What's happening with soccer, just in general? I mean, I, I really do feel like uh, it's gained a lot more of a foothold the last couple of years in America. I think the ESPN two telecasts have helped. I think um, things going into HD have helped. Yeah. I, it just seems like there's more of an awareness. Like, do you feel that now? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you think about 15 years ago, there's no way soccer was on the ticker on the bottom of ES on the screen on ESPN. Yeah. Now it's like every day there's soccer on the ticker, let alone how many the visibility, how many games are are shown, and how many people, like casual people, can name like ten soccer players compared to that. You know that same equivalent person 15 years ago couldn't have named one. And it also seems like the MLS has finally found like its way to get a little foothold here with some of these smaller cities. I mean, they're finding out that yeah, in a city like Seattle that just lost its NBA team. The MLS can be a nice friend and kind of uh, you know something that people can throw themselves into. It seems like that's happening. I mean, it's crazy. Like thirty plus thousand tickets in Seattle. Portland sold out every night. Vancouver's, I think, top four in the league in attendance. Toronto, Montreal, is the same. It's it is growing. It's it's uh, you know it is getting a foothold, as you said. All right, Steve Nash, you you you're doing a whole bunch of media stuff today for the uh, Dove Men Care, correct? Yes. How's that going? Do you get burned out? Do you need like some Gatorade? Do you need um, food? Can somebody get you some some after snacks? The, after the back to back and the sore back, six a.m. wake up was a little early, but I'm getting through it. It's been a fun campaign. We we'll get a chance to uh, you know Shaq and Tom Izzo recount some of our uh, NCAA uh, memories, <laughs> which were <laughs> which were fun and, and it kind of you know it actually kind of brought me back closer to March Madness this year than ever before to kind of go through those again. So oh good, enjoyed it. Well, I saved the soccer till the end because I wanted you to leave on a totally rejuvenated high note. Now you're just going to skip out of your house and be all excited. I'm floating. All right. Steve Nash, best of luck with the rest of the season. Hope you make the playoffs and uh, keep chugging along. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Before I get the sound off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. That's strange. It seems while Bill was busy serving up all that audio awesomeness, he forgot to mention the biggest news of all. The Italian Collection at Subway, talking some molto delicioso subs like the chicken pizziola melt, Italian BMT, and the mongelicious meatball pepperoni melt. Any one of these Bellissimo subs would be absolutely perfecto while taking in all the madness this March. So get to Subway pronto for a taste of the Italian Collection. Subway, eat fresh.